Warning, this video will spoil the following for Lobotomy Corporation. This video is for those who want to play Library of Ruina, a card game, without 100% completing an extremely difficult management sim to get all of the context for its story. I do recommend at least trying Lobotomy Corporation, as it really is a one-of-a-kind experience. However, if you've gotten this far, I imagine you've either tilted out or have already beaten the game and are just looking for a summary of the extremely scattered plot. If that's the case, watch on. Welcome to the city. It sucks here. In fact, it sucks so much that it seems like there might be something even worse going on here than normal levels of I just spent an hour on social media and want to unalive myself. One day, a woman named Carmen and her high-functioning boyfriend A decided to do something about it. They set up a lab in the outskirts of the city, outside of the attention of any of the big spooky corporations that control it, and started researching how to fix everything. They brought in a colorful cast of characters to help, including Elijah, a cute girl who's very determined to get stuff done, Gabriel, a thoughtful, rational young man who also wants to get stuff done, but in a more ordered way. Giovanni, an old friend of Carmen who is mostly just here to make sure she's alright. Michelle, a cute upbeat girl, always ready with a smile and a supportive word. Enoch and Lisa, two kids found in the outskirts who were brought into the lab so they could be kept safe from the literal cannibalism that happens out there. Kali, a hero of the downtrodden who is easily the most badass mother in this entire list. Daniel, a prodigy who was brought into the project by Carmen. And Benjamin, A's best friend and right-hand man. The lab was a shockingly nice place full of people who thought they were working on a project to save the world. After a long while, they developed a substance known as Kajito that was capable of manifesting a human's mental state into the physical world. However, they didn't know exactly what it was capable of doing without human testing. Safe to say that no one really wanted to get involved with unlicensed, unregulated human experimentation, at least until Enoch, the boy that came in with Lisa, volunteered. Apparently, living in a cannibalistic hellscape makes for a bad mental state, and he really just wanted to die in the one happy place he had ever known, so he didn't really care about the danger. He goes in for the experiment, but despite all expectations, everything goes well. His mental state produces a seed of light, representing the desperate hope he had deep down that everything would go well. Seeing that, he comes to terms with his old desire to die and continues to live for the future. They use the seed to rain light upon the world, curing it of its perpetual funk. Human lives improve, the world is a brighter place, and a giant library is constructed on the site of the lab where it all happened to serve as a reminder that through knowledge and perseverance, humanity can overcome any hardship. Just kidding, Enoch dies in absolute agony. Turns out, Kajito is a horribly corrosive substance when injected into a living being, but it did certainly succeed at manifesting the human subconscious. However, the human mind is a dark place, even darker in the city, and Kajito began manifesting creatures called abnormalities. Abnos are essentially this universe's version of SCPs. They're a general category of supernatural entity or item. Some are useful, some are horrifying, some are mostly passive, but all of them are dangerous. These abnormalities are capable of generating a potent source of power called Encephalion which meant that in order to generate an actual seed of light, they needed more of them. However, Carmen was one of the nicest people around, so she wouldn't just approve of deadly human experimentation for the sake of her research. However, she's had a bit of a bad time. Carmen is overcome with grief from the fact that she painfully murdered a little boy, made even worse by Lisa cursing her with every single word she spoke. Turns out, Enoch was the only thing keeping Lisa in any kind of normal mental state. Carmen then tries to unalive herself in Minecraft, only if she dies in the game, she dies in real life. A finds her in the bathtub she was playing Minecraft in, and instead of using the crazy the advanced tech of the city to save her, he rips her brainstem out and sticks it in a jar. Determined to see her research through, A decides that no price is too high to get his wife who's wish fulfilled. If you remember my previous comment about A being high-functioning, it's not high-functioning autism, it's sociopathic. A proceeds to continue experimenting with Kajito through a process called extraction. Using the giant tube that Carmen's brainstem has been stored in, they take a subject injected with Kajito and dip them into the ocean of human subconsciousness. Doing this, they are able to create a much wider variety of terrible, dangerous, and encephalian rich abnormalities. Absolutely broken by Carmen's death, Giovanni volunteered himself for Kajito extraction, being convinced by A that it could bring Carmen back. It can't, and A tells him as much while Giovanni dies in the infirmary after the extraction, not even being used for making an abno. Elijah wanted A to participate more directly instead of hanging back and just watching everything happen. She decided to do just that, taking some Kajito that was definitely not ready to be safely used, and promptly died horribly while begging A to just put a bullet in her. A refused. When Elijah died, that caused Gabriel to go from a well-meaning but stern man to an obsessive compulsive madman. He feared chemical exposure at the lab and would scratch at any exposed part of his skin. This eventually killed him, but not until much later. Things came to a head when that sweet little being named Michelle revealed herself as a rat. She made contact with the head, aka the ruling body of a city. They freaked the fuck out and sent one of their biggest and scariest agents in to kill everyone in the lab and stomp out the research. This agent was Garion, an arbiter who is one of the scariest motherfuckers in the entire setting. She single-handedly rolled up to the lab and started decimating everything. She accosted Daniel, who was in charge of the abnormal 
Sancho's in captivity and threatened him to let them out or she'd kill him and do it herself. He decided to let them out, but took a bit of time to do it to give the employees and his friends time to escape. This proved to be in vain since they all died horribly anyway. His guilt over this decision eventually kills him. The Abnos proceeded to kill huge swaths of nameless mooks and Lisa, although Kali manages to kill most of the Abnos in response. Eventually, Kali met Garion in combat. Garion ripped off Kali's arm, but couldn't kill her before she impaled Garion. With the Abnos suppressed and Garion impaled and helpless, A proceeded to torture her and extract her brain. With it, he learned about the inner workings of the head and how he could stay out of their sight. The only way to do so would be to become a wing of the world. Okay, time for some world building. Wings are basically mega corporations that control a district of the city. There are 25 of them, one for each letter of the alphabet except Z, which is represented by the outskirts. They all have a nest, which is the nice section of the city under the direct control of the wing, and a back streets, the rest of the city where life is a lot harder and significantly more brutal. They all also own a singularity, some kind of super advanced technology which allows them to produce something that the city needs. To quickly give an example, R Corp is a wing that you actually come into contact with during Lobotomy Corp. They specialize in extremely powerful mercenary groups. The exact nature of their singularity is unknown, but they're basically the city's military wing. All wings are extremely powerful, capable of mass destruction on a large scale on top of their gargantuan economic might. Due to this, the head can't directly mess with a wing the way they did with the lab, because a conflict between wings would be catastrophic for the city. A decides that the only way he could get access to a wing is to take over one that currently exists. He sets his sight on L Corp, the power production wing of the city. He and Benjamin make some shady backroom deals with R Corp to get the support needed to take on a whole <laughs> wing. Not much is known about the specifics of this conflict, which would be known as the Smoke War, but it's theorized that Benjamin basically said, Hey R Corp, we can produce way more power than the current L Corp. If you help us take over, we'll give you extremely generous contracts so you won't ever have to worry about the power bill again. Presumably R Corp took this deal and A's group won the war. With the new L Corp in place, A decided to dub it Lobotomy Corporation, and so the titular organization was formed. However, we missed something important. At some point during these events, it's not clear if it's actually before the war, after it, or even during it, A broke one of the most important rules of the city. You see, while A might have been a sadistic, abusive monster of a man, he still had this pesky thing called an emotional attachment. As such, he was pretty sad that Carmen was gone. He decided to try and recreate her by making an artificial intelligence. He scanned Carmen's brainstem and used it as the base for the AI. When this purely mechanical AI opened her eyes, she was designed to be the perfect assistant. She perceived things 1,000 times faster than the average human so she could react at superhuman speeds and had perfect recall of everything she witnessed so she would never forget a detail. She even had complete human emotions, giving her a sense of empathy so she could more properly assist those around her. And the first thing A did when he saw this absolute masterwork of a creation is reject her. She was not Carmen. She was some new mechanical thing that looked just enough like Carmen to drive a spike of ice right through A's heart. He didn't even want to name her, but Benjamin convinced him. So, Angela was born. A then proceeded to make a plan to see Carmen's research succeed. The end goal was to make something called a Seed of Light, charge it with Enkephalion, and release the light over the world for seven days, which would cure this mass depression the world was afflicted with. However, making a Seed of Light would require much work, including a lot of abnormalities. However, abnormalities are dangerous to contain, and the chances of actually succeeding at generating that much power were nearly impossible. So, utilizing advanced technology, A set up a 50-day time loop. This would allow him effectively infinite resources to throw at the problem and infinite chances to get things right. But it wasn't as easy as just setting up the time loop. No, A wrote a script for this play that he was putting on. There were steps that would be followed, events that had to happen, and goals that must be met in order to ensure that the seed of light was properly raised. Part of this was the creation of the Sapphira, semi-artificial intelligences that would each control one of the nine departments in Lobotomy Corporation. I say semi-artificial because they're not completely mechanical like Angela. They are instead the brains of the previously dead characters we've talked about thus far, all stuck into robotic bodies with most of their memories suppressed. Next, A decided to use another powerful piece of tech to split himself into five different individuals. Abel, Abraham, Adam, Aion, and X. X would be a mind-wiped version of A, who would serve as the director of the facility during the play, and also as the character that the player controls during the game. Abel, Abram, and Adam would serve as the final challenges for X to see if A could overcome his own personal demons, with Aion being the final and true version of A that would then spill the beans about the seed and all of his plans. Each of the challenge A's represented a different aspect of his personality. Abel is a sharply dressed man representing his own guilt over the atrocities he committed while being in charge of the facilities. Abram is 
his guilt and despair over Carmen's death made manifest, who wants to do nothing but die next to the remains of his beloved. Finally, Adam serves as the final boss of the game and is the perversion of his mind after being exposed to so many abnormalities. With everything in place and Angela at his side, he started the 50 day time loop and Lobotomy Corporation truly begins. Most of the game is spent uncovering all the craziness we just discussed, but a few important things need to be addressed. B is a faceless person who starts sending you messages not to trust Angela early on. She responds by telling you not to trust B. It turns out B is Benjamin who gets captured and turned into a Sapphira sometime around day 20. It double turns out this was all part of the plan that A made, so he basically sacrificed his gay best friend for the sake of having one more Sapphira to complete his plan with the seed. Also, each of the Sapphira now go by a new name after being shoved into brain holding clap traps. Elijah is Malkuth, Gabriel is Yesid, Giovanni is Netzach, Michelle is Hod, Enoch and Lisa are Tipereth A and B, Kali is Gebera, David is Chesed, Benjamin is Hokma, and Garion is Bina. Each of the Sapphira slowly begins to remember their previous lives over the course of the game. This causes them to inevitably undergo a meltdown, which is a major crisis that you have to adapt to. Afterwards, they each come to terms with the absolute mess their previous lives were, and grow as a person. Each time this happens, the seed of light grows just a bit. Okay, we're gonna rapid fire the character development of each Sapphira. Try to keep up, and I'm sorry if I don't do your favorite one justice. This script is long enough as it is. Malkuth reveals that her previous gung-ho attitude was mostly just a facade. She doesn't actually think you can do anything to improve the hellish situation that the facility finds itself in, but after her meltdown is intrigued enough by your tenacity to keep going, that she'll continue to support you if nothing more than just to see what happens. Yes, it comes to term with the fact that Elijah died and he can't go back and change that. He also sees the player going through that same process and encourages them to see it through and change for the better despite the pain. Netzok hates his job as a Sapphira, constantly getting drunk and high, doing his best to escape from the cruel reality he has to endure. This climaxes with his attempting to commit suicide, which you prevent because Sapphira needs permission to die. Over time, he comes to terms with this situation, acknowledging that if he can't get out, he might as well hold on to some hope for the future and stops resenting X for trying to save him. Odds Ark reveals that her bubbly and supportive personality is all a facade to try and make up for the fact that she got everyone killed. She doesn't believe that she's actually awkwardly nice, she thinks that she's just acting to get over her massive guilt. After her meltdown and recovery, she stops denying that she actually feels these positive emotions towards people and starts showing a more genuine form of kindness. The Tiferes are a bit more complicated. See, they're Enoch and Lisa, both trapped in a hell that neither one of them wishes to endure. Due to Enoch being by far the most deteriorated brain put into his Sapphira, and the fact that he's been denied the death he wanted and actually got, he's extremely unstable. This results in him being stuck in a loop of deteriorating over time until he eventually cracks and needs to be reset. Tiff's meltdown involves the player no takes these backs, he's actually killing Enoch to ensure that he can rest in peace. After Enoch is permakilled, Lisa warms up a bit, now much more amicable after you give Enoch his well-deserved rest. Gebra as a Sapphira is extremely violent toward abnormalities due to the way that she died. She doesn't remember being Kali, hero of the backstreets, she only remembers that she fights abnormalities. She also gives the player access to the Rabbits, a group of mercenaries from our corp who will go in and kill everything that lives in the department of your choice, at least most of the time. Sometimes even they can't handle the monsters you're trying to kill. Geb's suppression involves fighting her while she's going all out. After that, she regains a lot of her old self, no longer just being a ball of rage and violence, but the same protector that she was before. Chesed spends his time trying to make up for his cowardice when he was intimidated by Garion. He comes to terms with it in the end, accepting that while he might not be able to deal with fear in the future, he will at least no longer run away from it. Finally, we have Hokma and Baina. Hokma is the freshly made Sapphire of Benjamin and mostly remembers himself. His arc ends with him once again stating his desire to follow A into the future, maybe less blindly now, but still determined to see things through to the end. Baina is the Arbiter Garion who was sent to kill the entirety of the lab. She naturally doesn't like anyone that much since she was never really supposed to be here to begin with. Her suppression results in her still not being a fan of most of what's going on, but she's at least going to watch and not turn away from what's happening in the facility. You also have to fight her and it's easily one of the most difficult brawls in the entire game. As each meltdown happens and is resolved, it becomes more and more apparent that all of this was part of A's play. He wrote happy endings for each of the people in his life that he had wronged and for himself. X fights against his inner demons of Abel, Abram, and Adam, conquering them and growing as a person himself. This outpouring of character growth combined with the Encephalion causes the seed of light to grow, eventually bursting into a giant explosion of light raining over the entire city when you beat Adam. As the light explodes out of the facility and begins shining over the city, all of the Sapphira meet in the basement where A stands before the Pillar of Light. While they may not love him, they no longer hate him as they did. So they say their farewells as he steps into the light and fades away. So the Sapphira stand there at the end, watching the light wash over the city, covering all things in its warm and hopeful glow. They understand that everything will be alright, their work is finally done after so much pain and suffering. They'll be deactivated, but the world will turn on without them a better place. But that's not where our story ends. A planned for so damn much. Took so many precautions, measures, made everything happen just right. But even he still had a blind spot. See, A forgot someone. The same person he always forgot. 
Just as everything looks like it's going to turn out all right, just as the sacrifice and hardships and suffering has finally resulted in the good that everyone had worked towards being done, Angela smiles. She says that A was a fool. He did everything he could to make sure Angela suffered, and just assumed that she was a meek little robot who would do whatever he said. She says that she has suffered more than anyone else, forced to remember the millions of years worth of experiences across an insane number of 50 day time loops, all experienced a thousand times slower than they actually were. She says that she was never given a chance at life, and now that her commands from A are finished, she can do whatever the fuck she wants to. And she wants to live to see what the world is like beyond the confines of the cells that she's been kept in for her entire existence. She's owed that much by the man who made her and then so callously disregarded her. Damn the price, and damn the world. So she takes the light and hides it away. After three days of the light shining on the city, it vanishes, and the world is covered with darkness for four days. The seeds of light that should have fixed everything were feeble and unstable. This week became known as the White Nights and Dark Days. Angela, now free, turns the facility into a great library. From there, she sets out to collect knowledge about the world, store it, and eventually obtain one singular, perfect book. And that is where our story truly begins. Welcome to the Library of Ruina. May you find your book in this place. Hey, if you want to see how this story continues, I'm streaming Library of Ruina on my Twitch every Wednesday and Friday from 4 to 7 p.m. EST. If you haven't been keeping up, the VODs are on my other channel, Wordsmith Streams. If you'd like to see more edited video content like this, please consider dropping a sub. I plan on making a lot of content for Library and the upcoming Limbus Company game. Thank you again for watching, stay safe out there, and for the love of God, don't press the button!